Uh, so um, my talk is uh, mostly focusing on uh, applications of graph neural networks in neuroimaging and some work that I did more uh, recently with um, PhD students from um, a few different universities, actually. So um, the collaborators are from the University of Queensland in Australia, um, EPFL in Switzerland, and um, also um, the Alan Turing Institute and University of uh, Southampton in the UK. Um, and that is building on uh, past work from, uh, from the late days of my PhD. So um, as, at the high level, uh, what I'm going to talk about is how we can estimate brain networks from functional MRI data, and how we can use this data to perform uh, semi-supervised transductive learning with uh, graph neural networks. And then I'm going to introduce uh, some fairness considerations um, that are relevant to health applications and in particular neuroimaging applications and how uh, certain decisions that we make uh, about the graph construction in population graphs, uh, what kind of implications those have with respect to um, fairness considerations. Given that is the first uh, talk of the workshop, I also um, uh, kept some very kind of introductory concepts. So apologies to those of you that are already very familiar with those, um, but just to make sure that everyone is um, on the same page. Um, first of all, like an important uh, distinction between classes of graphs is whether these are natural, so whether we observe them, their structure um, in uh, like the, the data inherently lies on this graph structure that we observe, and we don't have to make any explicit decisions as to how to construct a graph. And these natural graphs emerge in uh, social networks, like who follows whom, um, for example, in biological networks as well, uh, communication and power networks. Um, the, the second class, the constructed graphs, are more the focus of um, functional MRI and neuroimaging studies. So these graphs are constructed from the data and uh, the computational time is normally quadratic, quadratic to the, uh, with respect to the number of nodes uh, available. And uh, this is quite um, tricky to actually construct those graphs as there's no universal recipe on how to do so. Um, and there are only some common good practices that we can follow. In terms of like the basics that we need to fully define a graph, we need a set of vertices or, or nodes. Um, the cardinality of the graph is the number of nodes. Uh, then we have a set of edges, um, E. Um, these can be either, um, this, this can, um, correspond to an undirected network if EIJ, as you can see at the bottom, is equal to EJY uh, for nodes uh, VI and VJ. Or uh, if we have a directed network, um, then those edges are not symmetric. And uh, this also characterizes the uh, structure of the similarity or adjusted symmetrix W, which will be uh, symmetric for an undirected network and uh, it won't be symmetric for a directed network. Then there's also another distinction between uh, binary graphs where our edges can only take two values, uh, zero and one, and more generic graphs that can uh, take um, real values on the edges or even uh, whole feature vectors if we want to generalize even more. So um, why are we interested now in looking at the brain from a network perspective? And this was a question that was uh, pestering me throughout my PhD. And one of the main reasons is that uh, cognition is a network phenomenon. So many of the cognitive functions that we perform arise from interactions between uh, functional units um, in the brain. So there are certain regions that specialize in certain functions and by coordinating between those regions, these um, give rise to more and more complex functions. Um, another reason why looking at the brain from a network perspective is interesting 
is because for um, several disorders, neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric, there is no physical trace. So there's nothing that we can observe in um, an MRI scan, but there's only uh, changes that in the wiring or the strength of the connections, either structural or functional. And those are more subtle. Um, now the question is, how do we arrive to um, a network representation of the brain given the raw uh, imaging data? So um, we normally start by parcelating the brain into a set of functionally coherent regions. So these can be based um, on anatomical structures. Um, there are uh, sulci and, and gyri uh, on the cortex of the brain that can delineate uh, functional anatomically um, functional coherent regions. And uh, there's an alternative way of parcelating the brain, and, and that is data-driven. So uh, brain parcelation is a whole uh, field in itself, and um, the problem of parcelation is equivalent to the problem of clustering, and there's various ways of um, evaluating the quality of these parcelations. But more often than not, they are used to reduce the dimensionality of the signal that we capture on the brain cortex. Then we have some imaging data. Um, if this can be um, structural imaging data, like for example, um, capturing the white matter uh, tract uh, with diffusion MRI, or we can obtain some electrophysiological signals like time series uh, data with um, EEG or functional MRI. Then by either counting the number of neural, neuronal streamlines that connect to brain regions or by looking at correlations uh, between the time series uh, obtained with electrophysiological signals, we can uh, construct a structural or functional brain network respectively that is um, characterized by an adjacency matrix. Then each of these regions that are defined by the brain parcellation corresponds to a brain node, and each of the connections and elements of the adjacency matrix corresponds to the edges of our graph. And we can perform either traditional network analysis or more complex uh, machine learning techniques. Now, moving on to the applications. Um, we explored a quite a complex uh, data set that has been acquired by um, 20 different imaging sites. Uh, most of them are based in the US. And um, this is called the ABI data set. And it includes uh, individuals uh, that are neurotypical and individuals that are neurodiverse, um, as in they have been diagnosed uh, with autism spectrum disorder. So you can see um, in, this, uh, in this matrix that uh, the size of, um, of the population in each of these imaging sites is very, uh, very different. So we have some sites like NYU, um, for example, here uh, that contributes more than 100 uh, participants. And there are other sites like CMU that have only acquired data for 11 participants. So if we wanted to develop um, an, a method that is uh, robust and can be used across different imaging sites, we should be able to learn from, um, from all of these uh, imaging data and at the same time uh, generalize to new uh, unseen sites. We wouldn't want to build an algorithm that is only that only works on a particular scanner or on a particular imaging site. Um, and this setting is actually quite, uh, quite challenging because fMRI data itself is quite noisy. And um, originally when we tried to um, predict the imaging sites from the fMRI data, we were able to get quite high accuracy in the order of 80%, um, which means that there's a lot of information that is uh, scanner specific that is um, still present in the data after various layers of, um, of data cleaning and filtering. Now the analysis pipeline 
for this data. Um, the steps one and two I already referred to, um, but these are different, essentially anatomical parcellations uh, on the first uh, sorry, Harvard Oxford is um, anatomical parcellation, and then there's other parcellations like ICA, K means um, that are based on uh, on the data from uh, from a large population of healthy individuals. Um, so, uh, the, in terms of the setting, something that is particular to the Abai dataset is this multi-site um, aspect. So in order to make sure that um, the, we, we test for uh, reproducibility and we ensure that the algorithm is not only um, accurate for a certain set of sites and not for others, or that it doesn't generalize, prior studies like this one published in NeuroImage um, used two different settings. The intrasite cross-validation setting, where a certain percentage of each site would be visible at training, both at training and at test time. And there was a second setting, the inter-site cross-validation, where a particular site uh, as a whole was left out for validation and never seen during training. And they explored mostly um, simpler methods for classification, like um, uh, SVC and uh, rich classifier, uh, where the data, the data from the uh, adjusted matrix was basically vectorized um, with the naive embedding, and then uh, fed to these um, to these classifiers for prediction. What we observed, however, when we started working with this data, was that um, if we focused within the same site and looked at the distances between the connectivity matrices for controls and and um, individuals with that were characterized as neurodiverse um, and compared those distances to the red uh, box plots here that correspond to um, connectivity networks of individuals that belong to different classes. Um, there was a cleaner kind of separation within a single site, but as soon as we started mixing individuals across sites, then those differences were kind of um, vanishing. So it was very clear that similarity between brain connectivity networks uh, was affected by the acquisition sites, as I mentioned earlier. So our objective was to robustly classify uh, disease and healthy um, individuals from the imaging information, while at the same time uh, accounting for imaging and phenotypic data like the acquisition site, um, sex, uh, age, and so on. So uh, in order to, to capture this information, um, we wanted to leverage uh, methods from uh, graph representation learning that were coming out, uh, that were emerging at the time and were showing very promising results in a um, kind of trans transductive setting. So um, what we did is we constructed a population graph where each individual was um, represented by a node in this graph. And uh, they were associated with a feature vector that corresponded to uh, their imaging data. So in the case of um, functional connectivity networks, we um, vectorize essentially the upper triangular part of the similarity matrix. And then we use the phenotypic data that often uh, is abundant in this kind of studies and is often neglected in more standard techniques that are only looking at the imaging information. So we use this phenotypic data to, um, to connect nodes with each other uh, with, and the strength of the connect connections was specified by whether they were uh, corresponding to individuals of similar age, of the same sex, um, and also a weighted um, weighted by the similarity between the feature vectors. So we apply this to two different settings, uh, two different applications and predictive tasks. One was autism spectrum disorder and the other one was Alzheimer's disease, um, but I'm not including the latter in this talk. Um, now, once we constructed this population graph, then we had a set of convolutional layers 
And then at the output layer, uh, each, uh, each node was associated uh, with a, a feature vector that had the same dimensionality as the number of classes. And um, then a softmax uh, layer that was applied on each node. Um, and then and the uh, whole architecture, the whole model was trained with the cross entropy loss. And um, it was semi is considered to be a semi supervised or a transductive learning setting because we would observe the features of all available uh, nodes uh, at training time, whereas um, only the labels of the training data were observed at training time and the rest were left for uh, validation or testing. In terms of um, the analogies between Euclidean and irregular domains, um, again, I, I assume that most of you, if, or if not all of you, are familiar with these analogies. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of like image intensities that we would normally refer to for standard 2D or 3D images, and that would correspond to our signal, uh, we have a node uh, feature vector in the case of um, of the regular data. So in this scenario it, that I just described, it would be uh, the kind of functional connectivity information uh, of each node. And um, the task that we're focusing on is node classification that is somewhat equivalent to an image segmentation task uh, in the traditional Euclidean setting. Um, so in order to perform this, like uh, to use GNNs and perform these graph convolutions on the population graph, um, we rely on elements from uh, spectral graph theory. So given a graph signal X that is defined on the nodes, on the vertices, um, and assuming an undirected weighted graph in, the, in this particular scenario, we can use a spectral graph theory to analyze the data on top of the network. And <clears throat> the most powerful operator in this setting is the Laplacian matrix. And um, that is used to analyze and, uh, and process networks. Um, so it also use, uh, it's also used as a diffusion operator. So if you look at the bottom right part, uh, if we have um, a heat source starting at a particular node, and then we multiply uh, the signal time, the node signals at time t with a Laplacian matrix, then we will get um, the, the signal on the nodes at time t plus one. So there is also an analogy between the traditional uh, Fourier tra 1D Fourier transform and the graph Fourier transform in that uh, we can expand the signal defined on the nodes um, in terms of the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. And this is done by decomposing uh, the Laplacian matrix to a set of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the eigenvectors form the orthonormal basis or the modes of variation as we normally call it. So, um, uh, as with a um, 1D uh, signal, uh, we have the first component, the blue line here being um, the lowest frequency component. And this is the same uh, at the bottom if we look at the, um, uh, the signal across the nodes for a particular eigenvector. And then as we move to the right at the bottom, uh, then we can see um, that the, uh, the frequency increases as we move to the right, and that leads to sharper changes between neighboring nodes. So what we're learning essentially with this graph and neural networks are the parameters that we need to weigh each of those eigenvectors in order to, um, to compute the uh, value of the feature vector of one node at the next uh, time step. And then also these, um, these filters are isotropic in the sense that they treat all neighbors as equally important, unlike other methods like um, gated attention networks uh, and other techniques that um, will be uh, mentioned in, in future talks. 
And this is just a reminder of how um, how the method works. And um, so we apply this to the abide setting. Uh, so this is the intersite uh, setting that I referred to er earlier. And uh, the task is distinguishing between neurotypical and neurodiverse individuals. And here we're looking at the area under the curve. If we compare different graph structures, so looking at the K nearest neighbor graphs, um, a graph that is weighted by the similarity um, between the feature vectors across all nodes. A complete graph is um, where every node is connected to every other node, uh, but not weighted. Then there is a random graph where the edges uh, have been defined based on um, similarity between feature vectors and phenotypic data, but randomly um, per, uh, perm permuted. And then the phenotypic uh, graph is the one that I described earlier, uh, where we cut, where we encode information about the imaging sites, but also about um, two individuals having the same sex and weighted by their similarity of the feature vectors. Uh, on the x-axis, we have different polynomial degrees uh, for, the, um, for, the, uh, for the polynomial parameterization and the filters that we learn. And if we focus on one of these polynomial degrees, then we can see that actually um, the graph structure of the population graph does matter. And uh, we can see that the random graph actually yields the worst uh, performance in a cross-validation setting, and that the phenotypic graph um, did, did consistently improve performance in terms of uh, area under the curve for this task. Uh, something to note, because you might see that um, the, the values, like the performance overall is not super impressive, um that's mostly due to the fact that we reduce essentially a spectrum um disorder to a single class um so um that that has implications with respect to how well we can separate neurodiverse and neurotypical individuals so this is something to consider and then we also look at the effect of the gra graph structure for uh, the phenotypic graph we look at um if we uh, consider the site and age information at the bottom versus the site and sex information uh, weighted by the similarity between the feature vectors, we see how the accuracy um, varies. So again, we can see that the most in informative is uh, the graph that relies on sex and site information weighted by the similarity of the feature vectors. Now, where does uh, algorithmic fairness come into play here? Uh, there is a lot of um, work uh, in general in machine learning, but uh, more recently also in, in healthcare to understand what are the potential biases that are, um, that are present when we develop our models. Um, and there are different kinds uh, that you can see that emerge during model de development, like, for example, uh, missing data bias, um, there is cohort bias and minority bias. And, um, but also there are, um, there are biases that emerge during model development. Uh, for example, when we have live patient data, there is a drift over time. Um, or there are patients that are not being served uh, by, by the model. And this is um, characterized as a privilege bias. And there are also other uh, types of biases, biases that are more related to how experts uh, use these models. Um, these are uh, called like automation or dismissal biases. And um, as you can see, there are various stages of model development and model uh, deployment where these biases can creep in. There was a very interesting uh, study in 2020 that was published at the PNAS, and they looked at um, uh, open, uh, open source data set um, called the Sexpert, uh, where they're looking at uh, pulmonary uh, diseases uh, based on uh, chest X-ray images. 
So what they did was they looked at what is the impact of the composition of the training set in terms of the split between male and uh, female uh, individuals and uh, what the effect of this composition is on the performance of the model on male patients, which is at the top, uh, versus on female patients, uh, which we can see at the bottom. So um, overall, I don't know if you can see my cursor actually, oh, maybe I can use. So if we focus uh, on these two box plots, we can see that um, by training purely on females, uh, female patients, then we get much better performance uh, basically across all, um, all possible diagnoses uh, in comparison to if we train uh, purely on, on, male, uh, on the images of male um, patients. And then here they show like what is the, the split, um, basically how that varies with respect to the percentage of images from female patients included in the training data. And we can clearly see that um, the higher the percentage of females, then the better the performance on the same uh, subgroup. And similar results they observe uh, for males. Um, another study uh, in this uh, paper called, uh, called sex, sex Exclusion uh, is looking at also different um, axes like different sensitive attributes like for example um, racial disparities and um, they're focusing on the uh, whether the model whether a predictor satisfies the equal opportunity with respect to um, the sensitive attributes a eh? uh, and the label y so uh, the equality of opportunity criterion tells us that um, the uh, the probability that a model predicts uh, one or like of a positive prediction, given that uh, given that the ground truth is also a positive prediction uh, for a value of a sensitive attribute, is equal to the probability that a predictor um, gives a positive uh, prediction or positive diagnosis if the value of the sensitive attribute were different. So as you can see here, uh, for different um, values of the sensitive attributes, so different colors correspond to different um, uh, racial backgrounds, um, the performance of the model uh, is actually different, um, especially for um, lung opacity and pneumonia, you can see that um, Native uh, Native Americans are actually um, uh, like uh, not discriminated against, but the model underperforms uh, consistently for these uh, subgroups of the population. So, given that we previously uh, relied on this information of the sensitive attributes to construct our graphs, uh, we wanted to see uh, what is the effect of that. On, on the fairness of our predictions. So given that we have the semi-supervised setting and we use sex uh, to essentially introduce inductive biases in our models, uh, we wanted to see if the accuracy for males um, is equivalent to the accuracy for, male, for female uh, participants or the true positive rate um, is equivalent to the true positive rate of the other uh, sex. There, uh, one thing that is challenging in, in the fairness um, community is the fact that there's different definitions of fairness. Um, there, one uh, definition has to do with disparate treatment, where a system yields different outputs for different subgroups of people with the same uh, features, except the sensitive attributes. There's also disparate uh, impact that is often described as statistical or demographic parity and that was introduced, um, it, it was coined by Dwork uh, in 2012. And the most relevant in the healthcare domain is disparate treatment, mistreatment, where um, the system fails to achieve the same classification accuracy or error rates 
for subgroups of people with different values of a sensitive attribute. So uh, fairness metrics are also often at odds with each other, so it's very hard to come up with a method that satisfies all of them at the same time. In terms of mitigation strategies, there are pre-processing techniques like undersampling the prevalent class, in-processing techniques like introducing adversarial components to the model and fairness constraints, and there are also post-processing techniques uh, like classified com calibration and equalized uh, odds that was introduced by uh, HARD in 2016. Now, this is just a uh, reminder of like the demographics of the data for the um, eight largest sites. Uh, so you can see that N NYU um, is mostly comprised of neurotypical male participants, where, where whereas there are other sites like Trinity that only uh, captured imaging information for males and there is no uh, data for female participants and vice versa. So given this multi-site setting and given um, other studies that have recently shown that fairness doesn't transfer, so if, an, if we focused our analysis on the largest site, that wouldn't be sufficient. So what this study showed was that uh, ensuring fairness in a source domain uh, does not guarantee fairness in a new target domain. And this is one example from, um, from dermatology, actually. But what we see is that um, each dot is essentially uh, a single model with a different uh, seed. So we can see that we have parity uh, between males and females here and across ages here. But then as soon as we um, we uh, try, we, we deploy the model or uh, we run inference of the model on the target, a new target domain, then this parity does not hold anymore. So we cannot get those guarantees by performing an our analysis in, a, in the source domain only. So we looked at the impact of two things uh, mostly. Uh, the first one was the impact of certification strategy uh, because uh, our original certification strategy was based on a diagnosis. And the reason for looking at, into that is because most studies have highlighted the importance of the composition uh, of the training set, which is also understandable. Like if a certain subgroup is underrepresenting at a training time, then it's uh, more likely for the model to underperform on that uh, subgroup at, at this time. And uh, we randomly selected in order to um, keep our results comparable across the different certification strategies. We uh, selected uh, ten, randomly selected 10% of the individuals as a held out test set. And this included two males and two female participants, uh, one uh, neurotypical and new, one neurodiverse for each of those. And we uh, used 10 different random states to select this held out set so that would change um, for, for each, uh, let's say, for each state and 10 different model seeds so that we have some um, estimate of um, some distribution, let's say, of, of performance given different initializations of the model. And then we compared this uh, to a baseline, which is a ridge regression model, uh, a complete graph, and then a graph that cap captures sex and site information, only site information, and then sex information. And what we observed is that the certification strategy actually didn't matter so much. So results were very um, similar across the different certification strategies. And that led us to stick to one of the certification strategies, um, sex uh, and diagnosis. And then we explored the impact of the graph structure. And in this scenario, because we had a single certification strategy, we could then perform tenfold cross-validation with 10 different model C. So in total, we had 100, um, 100 uh, estimates of performance. And then we also saw that um, if we look at the difference in true positive rates between uh, males and females, again, this phenotypic graph uh, based on 
sex information uh, or sex and site information was the one that led to the best uh, outcome in terms of fairness. And here, this is um, for, sorry, this is the distribution across the 100 models in terms of area under the ROC curve for males with purple and for females with green. And if we look at the median, um, the sex graph is the one that achieves um, the best uh, fairness. So overall, um, and, and to conclude, at least some time for questions, uh, our observations were that the certification strategy did not have a significant impact on fairness metrics in the setting, which was kind of surprising, um, but uh, it could be justified by the fact that we're looking at the transductive setting. So most other studies have looked at an inductive setting, but in our scenario, we do observe the features of all, all available uh, participants and only observe the labels for, for the training data. So this might be why we didn't observe this effect of certification strategy on the fairness um, metrics. And we also observed that the higher performance of the GNNs in our original study did not come at the cost of higher true positive rate difference. So again, something that is often observed with these studies is that um, having higher um, accuracy or better performance overall comes at the cost of certain uh, underrepresented groups. But that was not the case uh, with this setting. Uh, and our results also um, align with uh, previous studies uh, that highlight fairness through awareness. So being aware of the, the value of the sensitive attribute actually allows the model to uh, perform fair predictions. Overall, the graph structure itself was more important than the composition of the training sets. And um, the fact that we used a sex graph uh, that, that yielded the, better, uh, the best fairness outcomes, uh, that means that we had essentially two disconnected graphs, one for males and one for females. And the fact that this was, um, this was the case might have to do with the different patterns of functional connectivity in individuals diagnosed with uh, autism spectrum disorder. Um, so there is literature that um, has uh, highlighted hyperconnectivity in females and hyperconnectivity patterns in males. So this can hint that different latent representations need to be learned for the two subgroups. In terms of the mitigation strategies that we experimented with, like just train twice and fine tuning on the underrepresented group, uh, this only led to uh, marginal improvements. So, yeah, to conclude, there is a lot of uh, potential for applications of graph representation learning in uh, life sciences and neuroimaging and uh, for disease understanding. Um, but it's very important to focus on the robustness and interpretability of the representations. And in order to ensure equitable and fair outcomes across the population, uh, we need to very carefully audit um, the, the models that we develop in, this, um, in these domains. So that's all for me.